Good day to you. You know, it's pretty hard to imagine, but try if you would, to imagine what it would be like to live in the early 1700s in the United States. If you did, you would be living in a small, small, I don't even know if you would call it a town, but you would be living in a small community for sure, where you knew most, if not all, of your neighbors, including the shopkeepers. The people around you looked just like you do, in the same color, the same shape, they had the same ideas as you for the most part, not exactly the same, but you followed the same religion, you had the same ideas about what the goals were in life, etc. And then suddenly something starts to happen that we now call industrialization. Industrialization is where you have the invention of the factory, really, and the ability to produce goods in mass. And now all of a sudden, factories are being built and big cities are growing up around these factories like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and our own Pennsylvania. So now people start to move from these small town communities to these places where there are, is a mass culture. And now you're starting to mix with people that come from different backgrounds, people you don't know. The conditions that you're living in make life seem pretty impersonal. You're staying inside of an apartment that just has the basics because you're only there to work and to make money. And life has changed because you're living in a mass culture. Well, that's kind of the intro for today's class, because today's class is all about mass media effects. And it's about the effects of media on us when we are absorbing media at such an accelerated pace every single day. For example, in the average household, a television is on for over seven hours a day. Even if you're not watching it all, the, all those seven hours, it's on for seven hours a day. Aren't there some effects that are happening, just like effects that happen when people move to the big cities? So that's why this chapter on mass media effects, chapter two, starts out with industrialization. Now we're going to start to talk about effects of mass media. And this is a dense chapter. I won't be able to cover all of the ideas in this video, but I'll try and co cover some of them. In the, original, um, in the original example that I gave of people moving to the big cities, we also start to have the production of books and magazines being produced in a mass way by factories. And researchers at that time started to worry about what was called a direct effects model that was arising out of our thought process about what mass media do to us. And it's basically the idea, the direct effects model, that if you see something on TV, if you read something in the newspaper, it's going to have a direct effect on you. So that's why, for example, we don't have nudity or sexual scenes in American media, um, especially in those free media like, like television that you receive um, in your household, because the a direct effects model would say that that young people who see uh, a married couple making love inside of a, a narrative and a drama, for example, that those young people would get the idea and that they would start to have sex at an early age. That's the direct effects model at play. Well, as research started to mature and more people started to get into the field of studying mass communication, there was a, a criticism of the direct effects model that it was just too severe and too primitive. So that gave rise to the next way of looking at mass media the effects of mass media, and that's the limited effects model. And this came about during World War II. Paul Lazarsfeld was a, an American professor, and he started to study the effects of propaganda during World War II. If you were to go to a movie, by the way, during World War II, before the movie would start, there would be a trailer that would be, and I don't mean to, to be so harsh with this in your face, but it's the truth, um, the trailer would be about kill a Jap today. And it might be a cartoon, or it might be a black and white film. And it was propaganda. It was part of the American government's uh, attempt to influence the public. Um, Paul Lazarsfeld took a look at this, and he also took a look at voting patterns. And he came up with what he called the limited effects model, which says that people are not affected directly by mass media. Instead, what happens is a little bit more complicated. We are more affected by opinion leaders, people whose opinions that we value. So we are affected by our teachers. We're affected by our parents. We're affected by elders who we know, older people who we're friends with. We're affected by shopkeepers, by politicians, etc. Those are the people we're affected by. Those people are affected by the media, the opinion leaders, but then we're affected, the common people, by the opinion leaders. This research model gave way to a more sophisticated research model called the critical cultural model. It starts, it starts to place a little bit more responsibility and understanding on the audience now because it really tries to understand the critical cultural model, how audiences are getting meaning from media. So if you were to talk to somebody about guns today, it's such an interesting conversation. Uh, I'm against guns, and the people that I speak to are all saying, how can the San Bernardino massacre happen 
And the response is, we need more guns. We need more people to be armed. Um, I listen to that, and then I listen to people who are gun owners, and they have the exact opposite opinion. They say, how is it possible that people think that we should take away guns? That's going to make us more unsafe. And it's just really interesting trying to remove myself and be an objective observer of those two very different opinions because it's really speaking to this critical cultural model. It's the idea that people, depending on your prior beliefs, are using the news reports about San Bernardino and Paris and the other mass killings to reinforce the way that they already think about guns. And that's what the critical cultural model is talking about, is how audiences gain meaning from the media rather than the media doing something to audiences. All right, so now we go into a whole new area of not looking at models, but looking at message effects of media. What are the effects of messages? And the first effects that we can take a look at are cognitive effects, effects on the way that we think about things. So, for example, right now, there is, um, for the most part, the country believes that um, same-sex marriage is, is okay. And, in fact, we have the uh, Supreme Court ruling that it is. But if you were to go back 20 years and look at news media reports, there would be an entirely different discussion. And the discussion would be, well, maybe, maybe same-sex marriage is not really the way that we should go for couples who want to have the same health benefits, who are homosexual and who are with each other. Instead, what we should maybe have is a civil union. Um, it's kind of being unionized by a justice of the peace, and then you still have all the same rights as if you were married. Well, that conversation is not taking place anymore. And so people's thinking is very different today based on the media reports, some would say, and that's a cognitive message effect. It's changing our thinking. That's different from an attitudinal effect. An attitudinal effect is how you sort of agree or disagree with what's going on. So if you disagree that same-sex unions or same-sex marriages should be the law of the land, then you have an opposite attitudinal effect than most of the American public, according to polls. It's an attitudinal effect from the message. Then there is the behavioral effect. It's how you behave. So if we take a very different subject, uh, the subject of drugs, for example, there's a lot of talk now about how pharmaceutical drugs, a lot of media coverage about how pharmaceutical drugs are leading to an addiction epidemic in this country, including um, people going from oxycodone and other, um, uh, what are they called, uh, uh, missing the word right now, I can't think of it. It's uh, not a... Uh, well, anyway, going from oxycodone to heroin, um, it's a barbiturate, but it's a, a painkiller, and it's a, it's a problem in this country because we have a heroin epidemic. And so how are we changing our behavior based on that? Are we going to curtail the prescription? Uh, we've done that. There have been some laws passed that make it, make it stricter for doctors to, to hand out prescriptions for oxycodone and oxycontin. It's a behavioral message effect from the media that we're watching. That's different from a psychological effect. A psychological effect I don't think is really defined that well in the book. It's defined as the way that your body changes. Uh, I'm more comfortable calling it a physiological effect. It has to do with when your heart goes racing. And when you watch a, a thriller on TV, let's say if you're a person who likes to watch horror films or horror shows, um, do you do that in part because you like your heart to get racing? You like your adrenaline to get going? You like to feel psyched up? Well, it's a behavioral effect that comes from a mass media uh, message. Now, those are all message effects. Now, let's talk about medium effects. Medium is the vehicle by which a mass media message is transported. So, a telephone is a medium. A television is a medium. A newspaper is a medium. And each medium has its own effects on the message by virtue of what its strengths are. So if you watch a local TV news program, almost every single night at the top of the hour, you will see either a murder or you will see a fire. Now, why is that? Let's take fires. Fires are very well suited to television because they look incredible. They look sensational. You see that bright burning glow on your TV screen. It's really something to watch. But fires are not so good to be conveyed in newspapers. It's not the same thing as using a person's quote talking about the tragedy of a gun killing. So by virtue of the fact that TV uses visual images, we're going to see more fires in the, in the content. And by virtue of the fact that newspapers doesn't ha not have the same thing as a moving video, we're not going to see as many fires. That all has to do with medium effects. One of the most famous scholars in our field, Marshall McLuhan, a Canadian scholar, Canadian professor, 
had the, the saying, the medium is the message. And what he's talking about is just being on the medium is important to people rather than the message sometimes. So being on the cell phone, because you're holding it in your hand, it makes you feel comfortable, makes you feel like you have control over something, makes you feel like you have a possession. It doesn't really matter that you're texting somebody or that you're tweeting or that you're going on eBay. What really matters is that you're on the medium. The medium is the message. All right, now let's go to ownership effects. Ownership effects has to do with how our media content is affected by virtue of who owns the media. And we know that there really are only a handful of companies that own most media properties today, the News Corporation being one of them, which owns Fox. It owns the Washington, uh, owns the Financial, uh, 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 Wall Street Journal, excuse me, um, two big media properties. We also know about Viacom, which owns CBS and VH1 and, and MTV. And then there's Disney, which owns ABC and ESPN. And the, by virtue of the fact that there's just a few companies, we have fewer choices. So if you get in your car and you turn the radio on and you drive from Allentown to Pittsburgh, what are the odds are that you're going to hear a Taylor Swift song two, three, four times as you're driving across the country? Or Adam Levine or Bruno Mars or... Adriana Grande, or choose who you want. There's a handful of people that you're going to hear because just a few companies are owning the media. And that's what ownership effects is speaking about. And then there is active audience effects. It's a different kind of effects. Active audience effects say that the, the effect is different depending on what kind of an audience group you are a member of. So for example, there are geographics that are used to study audiences. Geographics look at where you live. In California, for example, if you were to watch TV, you would see a lot of car chases. There's almost always a story that has to do with traffic, and that's because so many people are driving in California. The freeways are very much what your life revolves around. Well, that's going to be very different if you're living in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, although we are having more traffic in, in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. But the point is, by virtue of where you live, your geographic, um, the media are going to be affected differently in terms of the content that's offered. And compare that to demographics as well and psychographics, two other audience effects that we'll consider together now. Demographics are facts about the audience, and psychographics are feelings and beliefs. So if you look at students at East Stroudsburg University, it's just a fact that they're 19 and 20 years old, and that means that for the first time, they're starting to really venture out and be on their own and break away from their parents. Um, but that also means that they're going to have feelings of wanting to really explore their freedoms in ways that they might not do later in life. Explore their freedoms sexually, explore their freedoms in thought processes, breaking away from the way that they were raised with their parents. Exploring their freedoms in terms of how they spend their time, staying up all night, for example. These are demographics and psychographics about the college age audience, which leads them maybe to not be looking at much media content at all because of the virtue of their demographics and psychographics. They're more interested in spending time with each other. Now for the last part of class, we go to theories of media and society. And it's talking about what kinds of roles and functions that media fulfill for society. And the very first uh, concept that's talked about is a functional theory um, developed by Paul Lazarsfeld. And the functional theory says that media function for us. They function for us in three ways. One is surveillance, that is, they survey our surrounding environment. We kind of use media like their antenna coming out of us, like a, a cell phone is like a third eye that we have, and it helps us see what's out there. That's why when you go on vacation, you take photos, and it's almost like you see more by looking at the photos than you actually do by looking at the steeple or the ocean or wherever you are, you look at it after the fact in your photo, you're using the phone to extend your surveillance. Then there's also correlation that's part of a functional role. A correlation is where we try to interrelate all the parts together of a society. So if you go to Florida for the first time and you see how Floridians are listening to radio and you see that they're listening to some of the same radio programs, the same radio songs that you're listening to, then you're saying, you know what? Now I see that I'm kind of like a Florida person, but I'm also different. They look more like surfer people, and they have more tans, and they're blonder. I don't know, whatever stereotypes you want to use. But the way that we're similar is we like similar kind of music. I don't see any guys with long hair and earrings, okay? So we're, 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 we're not, we're, those are people that we're not. We, what we are is shorter hair and, and tattoos, for example. It's correlating parts of society. 
And then there is socialization. This is how we learn the way that we're supposed to behave in life. So you know, for example, that when you go to um, a convenience store, that it's acceptable to park your car and, and leave the engine running and go inside. Um, we learn that because we see that on television and programs. Um, but if you go to other countries like Sweden, for example, that is not allowed by law. You're not allowed to let your car idle for more than 60 seconds because of the pollution that it's putting out. And so that's the idea that media function by socializing, as teaching us how to behave. Next up is the agenda setting theory. In the agenda setting theory, what we're talking about is that media don't tell us what to think. Media tell us what to think about. So if I were to ask you right now, what are the two most important issues that are facing America? You might say one is ISIS, and the other that you might say is gun violence. You're probably not going to say rebuilding roads and bridges. Why is that? Because roads and bridges are not being covered in the news. Roads and bridges are not being talked about on talk shows. Roads and bridges are not being tweeted about. But ISIS is, and San Bernardino is, and that's part of the agenda-setting theory. Media don't tell us what to think, they tell us what to think about. Next up under the theories of media and society is the agenda setting theory. Uh, sorry, the uses and gratifications theory. The uses and gratifications theory puts a lot of stock in the ability of the audience. It says that the media doesn't use audience. No, it's the other way around. The audience uses media. And so I'm going to use this TV show to help me fall asleep. I'm not being affected by it. I'm using it. I'm in control. I'm going to use this radio song to get happy about my day that's coming up. That's the uses and gratifications theory. Then there is the social learning theory, which I'm going to skip, the symbolic interaction theory that I'm going to skip. I'm going to go instead to the spiral of silence. This is the idea that there is a minority opinion out there that, that is not being expressed because people feel that they're going to be put down or harassed or and otherwise pressured that their opinion is not valid. So, for example, if you don't believe in God in the United States, um, good luck to you, because everywhere you go, people are going to say, God bless to you, even when you sneeze. Um, if you go to an event, people are going to say, okay, now we'd like to bow our heads. I went to an East Stroudsburg Borough Christmas dinner, and uh, the, there was an invocation, and the person said, okay, everybody bow their heads. Now we are going to meet our maker. Um, there was absolutely no allowance in that statement that there might be people who don't happen to believe. And so what you find is non-believers, to use an example of spiral of science, they don't say anything. They feel intimidated. So they just keep their thoughts to themselves. And that's what the spiral of silence is all about, that media pressure us not to express minority opinions. Next up is something called the cultivation analysis. Cultivation analysis is interesting to talk about. It was developed by a researcher here in Pennsylvania, George Gerbner, teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. The cultivation analysis is all about the idea that media cultivate in us certain fears and sensitivities. So if you watch a lot of local TV news versus somebody who does not, generally speaking, you're going to be more afraid of your surroundings because you see so much crime on local TV news. And that's going to lead you when you walk out of your house, if a car pulls up to ask directions and they come up to you, you're going to be hunched back. You're going to be at arm's distance just in case you need to run. You're going to be suspicious. You're going to give quick directions. You're certainly not going to put your arms on the, on the door of the car. It's because you have a fear that's cultivated inside of you by virtue of what you're watching. All right, there is one more idea to talk about. Sorry, this was on my second note card. I didn't see it, but it's the last idea for today. It's the idea of media and political bias. There are two biases that are talked about in the media under what the possible effects of media are. One is a liberal versus conservative bias. Um, most people consider the media to be liberal, um, to be left of center, to be more open to social, political, and economic issues. Um, but there are some very, very strong right-wing media pockets that we can find in talk radio, for example. Um, almost all talk radio shows that are political are right-wing talk political shows, but most people consider there to be a liberal bias in the media. And then the second bias is uh, Herbert Gans, another researcher, talks about basic journalism values, and these values communicate biases. And there are a bunch of biases. I'm only going to cover three. One of them is ethnocentrism. If I were to ask you, what is the most common language spoken across the world, what's your answer? It's English, right? Guess what? You're wrong. It's Chinese. But English is second, right? No, it's not. Spanish is second. English is third. 
Okay, but if you grow up in the United States, you have an ethnocentric bias. That is, you believe that your ethnicity is at the center of the universe, ethnocentricism. So it's easy to believe growing up in the United States that because all of our TV programs and radio programs and all the social media that we look at, for the most part, are in English, that English is the most common language across the world. It's not. Um, next up is the idea of altruistic democracy. This is the idea that politicians should serve a greater good. That's sort of reinforced. And so we're constantly finding politicians committing scandals. Um, there was a senator that just lost an election um, in Louisiana because he was with a prostitute prior to that. And so his opponent ran campaign ads saying he chose prostitution over patriotism. Well, that's speaking to the altruistic democracy. It's a, a value that we don't hold towards business leaders. We don't hold business leaders to the same standards. We say that business leaders, they should be able to make as much money as they want because they're entrepreneurs. And they uh, symbolize the great American spirit of rags to riches. Um, we don't have altruism, which is the idea of giving yourself freely over to somebody else for a greater public good. We don't we don't assume that as part of business leaders, but we do for politicians. And then finally, the whole idea of capitalism in and of itself is a, is a bias within the media. Uh, we just assume that it's a good thing to have and that it's the best thing and that it's the only thing. Um, ask a person what the difference is between socialism and communism, and they have a very hard time coming up with an answer because we're taught only that capitalism is good and we don't really understand... I'm speaking generally here, what its weaknesses are um, in terms of people not fixing their own sidewalks or um, being taken advantage of by credit card companies or student loans. Those things are talked about in small pockets, but the system as a whole, capitalism, is reinforced when media talk about it. They talk about it as a good system for the country. All right, so that wraps up some of the many ideas on media effects in society. I hope I've given you something to think about today. Have a great day.